Hi, I'm Elif Mizrahi, and in this video I will present my joint work with Aviv Zohar, evaluating a low-cost attack on the Lightning Network, paralyzing it for several days. The Nakamoto consensus, which is at the core of Bitcoin, suffers from a scalability problem, meaning it is limited in the rate at which it can process transactions. The Lightning Network is thought to be the most promising solution to this problem. We leverage a known limitation of payment channels and show that this network has a vulnerability that arises from its fundamental properties. We simulate different attacks on the Lightning Network using snapshots of the live network and evaluate their efficiency and costs. And finally, we suggest different mitigations that make the attack harder to carry out. Before diving into the details, I'll try to summarize the attack in brief. The Lightning Network is a payment channel network. As of the beginning of 2021, it has more than 16,000 nodes and 37,000 channels, and it holds a total capacity of around 1,100 Bitcoins. When one user wants to transfer money to another, it picks a route between the nodes in the Lightning Network and opens a payment request through that route. The request has a validity period, a timeout, in which it stays open and waits for approval or rejection. Our attack is based on the fact that the payment can remain open for a long time, up to two weeks, and that there is a limit on the number of concurrent and resolved requests that can pass through a channel at the same time. Therefore, an attacker can connect to the network and initiate many small concurrent payment requests along the same route. It will keep the payments open until the last moment and then cancel them. In the meantime, all channels along the route will have exhausted their maximum capacity of requests and therefore will be blocked for new payments. The total non-refundable cost of paralyzing the entire network is less than half a Bitcoin. We explore three modes of attack. The first attempts to block as many high liquidity channels as possible. The second aims to disconnect as many pairs of nodes as it can. And the third concentrates on isolating a specific node from the rest of the network. We will analyze the attacks in more detail later in the presentation. First, we must understand a bit more about the Lightning Protocol. There are many different attack vectors on the Lightning Network that were explored in prior works. We don't have time to mention all the great work that is being done in this area, so I'll mention just a few papers. You can find additional related work cited in our paper. First, the paper by Roheretal show, among other things, that you can disrupt a channel by shifting all of its liquidity to one side. Another attack that is mentioned there and explored more in depth by the second paper, which is by Paris Solan and her co-authors, shows that you can lock a channel by requesting a payment through the channel and keeping it unresolved. The liquidity in that payment is then tied down until the request eventually expires. This attack, which is widely known as the griefing attack, is the most similar to the one we explored. The main difference being that we use very low liquidity payments and therefore do not need a lot of funds locked in to paralyze many channels. Finally, I'll mention two other papers from our lab that attack the Lightning Network. The first work by Jonah Harris and Aviv Zar synchronizes a large-scale attack that forces nodes to resolve payments on-chain to the point where congestion prevents all claims from being resolved. This actually allows the attacker to steal funds from victims. The last paper by Sar Tochner and others show how to attack the routing layer in the network and cause a massive disruption. The Lightning Network allows us to make transfers outside the blockchain safely. We therefore gain several important advantages. First, Lightning supports a higher rate of transactions per second. It manages to do so because you don't need to write to the blockchain for every payment. Micropayments become possible. This is because in the Lightning Network, fees are much lower than in the blockchain. Finally, we can perform instant payments. We don't have to wait 10 minutes for a block to be mined. Once participants establish a channel, they can then perform secure payments without further interaction with the blockchain. For example, if Alice and Bob want to open a channel between them, first they need to lock funds using a blockchain transaction. This essentially establishes the channel between them. They can then make as many offline transfers as they wish within the budget of the channel. When one of them decides to settle the payment, 
they can independently submit a redistribution of the channel balance to the blockchain, which closes the channel. Payments can also be made between two users with no direct channel between them by transferring the payment through a route. To implement this, conditional payments are used to ensure trustless transfers, and onion routing is applied to enable privacy. As in conventional onion routing protocols, this means that the sender of the payment chooses the entire route. Let's take a closer look at payment channels. Alice and Bob want to open a channel. They lock an initial amount of money in an address from which withdrawals can only be made by both of them. That means this is a multi-sig address that requires both of the signatures to move funds. This transaction is sent to the blockchain. To operate the channel, each of them holds the transaction signed by the other, giving them the money back. Now, to make a transfer off-chain, Bob and Alice can send each other new transactions with different balances that redistribute the money in the channel. It is important to understand that as long as the channel is open, the transactions that they exchange are not posted to the blockchain. However, the transaction that they hold guarantees that they can always receive their funds. Alice, for example, can add her signature to the transaction and send it to the blockchain even without Bob's involvement. There are a few more details on revocation of all transactions that I'm skipping here. Next, let's consider how multi-hop payments work. Let's say that Alice wants to send money to Dave, but there is no direct channel between them. Dave picks a secret S, hashes it, and sends the hash to Alice. He uses a free image resistant hash function, meaning it's hard to guess the secret. Now, Alice chooses a route to Dave. For now, let's just consider the specific route. First, for a payment through this route to succeed, there needs to be sufficient liquidity in each channel to allow the payment through. Let's assume Alice wants to send X bitcoins to Dave. She begins by promising Bob X bitcoins if he reveals the secret before the blockchain reaches a height of T1 blocks. This is done by preparing a conditional payment contract called HTLC, which basically says that Bob can redeem the Bitcoins if he presents the secret, but if the timeout elapses, Alice is allowed to take her money back. This mechanism ensures Alice that her money won't be locked forever in case the secret is never revealed. Once Bob receives this promise from Alice, he issues a similar promise to Carol. He'll give her X bitcoins if she reveals S before some timeout T2. Bob doesn't worry that he'll lose X bitcoins to Carol, because if Carol withdraws money, then he learns the secret S and can recover the funds from Alice. The process keeps propagating along the route until it reaches Dave. Dave already has the secret, which will be propagated back until it reaches Alice. Bob, which doesn't want to close the channel with Alice, gives her the secret and waits for her to replace the HTLC with an unconditional payment to him. Now that we have seen the correct operation of the channel, we want to explore scenarios that take place when things don't go as planned. This will tell us about the limitations of the behavior of the channel and will give us some information that we'll use during our attack. The first thing we're going to learn is that the expiration times have to be spaced out. There has to be waiting periods between the expiration of the HTLC in one channel to the one preceding it. This is called CLTV Delta. I'll show you why we need this. The second thing I'll show you is what happens when we reach the expiration time or when we cancel the HTLC and don't propagate the secret all the way. Let's take a closer look at the request timeouts. The values of timeouts decrease along the route. Otherwise, for example, if T1 is smaller than T2, then Carol can steal money from Bob by returning him the secret after Alice redeemed back her funds. Not only that we want the values to decrease, but we also want them to be spaced out enough to allow users to dispute on time when needed. Let's look at the case where Carol returns the secret to Bob at the last moment. The delta between Bob's incoming and outgoing HTLC timeouts is the remaining time it has for making sure that he gets his share from Alice. But what if Alice doesn't replace the HTLC with an unconditional payment to him. In this case, Bob loses money. Therefore, 
Bob must reserve enough time before the expiration of the HTLC with Alice to access the blockchain and redeem its funds if needed. This amount of time Bob is willing to tolerate is called CLTV Delta. The same goes to the rest of the nodes, which leads to the last equation that shows that the timeout of payments is at least the accumulation of the CLTV deltas of nodes in the route and can therefore reach up to several days. Let's talk about what happens when we reach the expiration time. Bob is expected to return an answer to Alice before the HTLC expires, otherwise she will close the channel with him. If Bob for any reason fails to return the secret on time, he needs to send Alice a failure message before expiry, notifying her that the payment failed and asking her to remove the HTLC from the transaction. Such cancellations happen frequently and do not reveal the exact cause of failure. For example, when payments fail due to a lack of sufficient liquidity in a forwarding channel. Now, suppose we have an attacker connected to the network in several places and it wants to initiate a payment and withhold it. Then it can pick a route and request a small payment through it. In the Lightning Network, the sender of the payment sets the timeouts of all HTLCs along the path using the data of CLTV deltas that the nodes publish. Hence, the attacker can set the last HTLC expiry along the route to the maximum allowed value. Now the attacker can hold the payment for a long time and at the last moment cancel the payment without penalty or loss and maintaining anonymity. Let's talk about the situation where a single channel is receiving a lot of payments in parallel. Each time a payment is forwarded through the channel, Alice and Bob update the transaction to contain the new HTLC and the transactions gets bigger and bigger. Since transactions might eventually reach the blockchain, the limit on a block size limits the transaction size. This limits the number of HTLCs that can be added to a transaction and therefore also the number of concurrent open payments that can be forwarded through the channel. Now we will present the basic idea of our attack, how to lock multiple channels in the network. We rely on public data that nodes provide us in order to choose the routes wisely, meaning choosing routes that can be parallelized for a sufficient time and at low cost. After picking a route to parallelize, the attacker connects to the source and target of this route and sends multiple small payments through it that will be kept unresolved as much as possible. The maximum number of simultaneously unresolved requests in a channel is limited. Therefore, at some point, the channels will not be able to receive new requests. Finally, the attacker will cancel the payment requests right before they expire, receiving back the amount and fees which were transferred through the route and staying anonymous. Nodes along the path don't know the attacker was responsible for the failure of these payments. It can then repeat the attack again and again using the same channels it opened before and the same funds for new transfer. Note, it is enough for the attacker to have a single node and perform circular payments. Now that we understand how the network works and how to parallelize channels along routes, we will present the different variations of the attack and evaluate them. First, I want to clarify that due to ethical concerns, we did not attack the live network. Instead, we used the code of actual Lightning Node implementations to test small paths for the mechanics of the underlying attacks. We simulated the attack based on the actual network topology and on values we deduced as I will explain next. We carried out the simulation for different time periods. The Lightning Network has three main implementations, LND, C Lightning, and Eclair. Each uses slightly different default values for parameters of interest. To properly evaluate the attack, we need to know various parameters for each channel. While some parameters like CLTV deltas are known, other parameters like the maximum number of HCLCs for a channel are not published. When we run the attack in practice over the network, we can learn these parameters by just trying different values and seeing what blocks up the channel. However, since we did not want to attack the network for our evaluation, we had to try and estimate some of these parameters. Our method for estimating them was to try and look at the different implementations and their default values. We noticed that some people usually use the default values, 
And so we try to deduce which implementation every node in the network was using and assume that it was using default parameters for that implementation. That is the basis for our evaluation going forward. Eventually, our results show that most of the nodes, actually around 91% of them, run the LND implementation, and we'll show you in a second what that means. This table summarizes the default values for different parameters in the three main implementations of the Lightning Network. The parameters we wanted to deduce are highlighted in yellow. These are the max concurrent HTLCs that the channel can hold, and the dust limit, which constrains the amount of money that can be transferred in each payment using the HTLCs. Other values we take from those which are published by the node themselves. We have reasons to believe people use default values because we see that for the values that are published, most are using the defaults. We will now see how the table can help us to get a general understanding about the amount of time that payments can be delayed for and the cost of the attack. Picking a route to lock, we are restricted by a maximum route length of 20 hops and a maximum payment delay called lock time of two weeks. In our attack, the time that the attacker can delay a payment equals to the expiry time belonging to the HTLC of the last channel in the route. Since the Lightning Network utilizes onion routing and the sender is the one to set the expiry times of HTLCs along the route, it can also set up the last HTLC timeout, setting it to a high value and causing a delay of up to several days. Over the last two years, there is a sharp decrease in the CLTV delta values that nodes on the network declare and an increase in the value of the maximum payment delay. Both make the attack much easier to carry out. We attribute this change to a change in the Lightning Network standards that was made in one of its newer versions, which caused LLD to change the default values. We begin with our first attack, where we want to lock as much liquidity in the network as possible. We utilize a greedy algorithm that divides the network into disjoint paths that are locked for at least three days. The algorithm picks right as follows. We start with a high capacity channel and connect to it. Then at each iteration, we add an adjacent channel of maximal capacity according to given constraints. For example, paths may not exceed 20 hops, they must be locked for at least three days, etc. We end up with an attackable route. We then remove it from the network and repeat the process. The number of channels the attacker needs to open directly impacts the cost of the attack. So here we can see the fraction of the capacity of the network which is paralyzed as a function of the investment of the attacker in opening new channels. For example, the attacker needs to open 480 channels in order to paralyze 70% of the network's capacity. At first thought, you could think that our heuristic algorithm might be far of the best thing we can do, but we actually have an upper bound on how well we can break up the network. To calculate this bound, we pay attention to the fact that attacked routes consist of at most 18 channels that do not belong to the attacker itself. We bound our results by letting the attacker paralyze 18 channels for every two channels it opens and letting it select the channels by decreasing capacity, completely ignoring the fact that these channels may not be connected to form proper paths. This idealized upper bound is deprecated by the red dashed line in the graph. You can see that the results of our greedy algorithm are very, very close to this upper bound to the point where we felt we did not need to invest more effort in proving the heuristics. Here's our evaluation of the costs. We want to distinguish between two types of costs. Fees that we pay, which are non-refundable, meaning money that we lose, and liquidity that we lock, but which we can essentially get back at the end of our attack, or that we can reuse for further attacks. To understand how we derive these costs, we need to think about the fact that there is a bound on the minimal payment that can be sent in the Lightning Network, which will result in an HTLC. These are mostly defined by the dust limit. Payments are a bit complex, since if, for example, Alice wants to send X Bitcoins to Dave, she also needs to add fees for every node along the way. Therefore, the initial payment that we need to send over a very long route 
could be substantially larger than the amount received by the end node because of these fees. Fees change depending on the channel and are a mix of a fixed amount and an amount that is proportional to the sum being sent. To run this attack, we need to lock money for these payments, which are multiplied many times as we are initiating many small payments at once. In the results, we show that the attacker can paralyze most of the liquidity in the Lightning Network for three days, spending less than half a Bitcoin, which refers to the non-refundable cost. But once channels are established, the attack may be repeated again and again with no additional cost at all. Of course, this depends heavily on the current structure of the network and costs are expected to grow as more channels are added. Still, it's a low cost compared to the total value that is locked within Lightning, which is roughly 1,000 Bitcoins. Here we show that the attacker succeeds in attacking long routes, exploiting the maximum route length, and that most of the routes are locked for more than the three days that were set as the minimum lock time. We ran the attack, changing the number of days the channel remained locked for. The results show that the number of attacker channels required to lock paths for different periods differs only slightly, meaning we can lock the channel for longer times in the attack without a significant change in costs. This is reinforced by the results from the previous slide and can be explained by the fact that most of the liquidity of the network can be attacked using routes that consist of small CLTV expiry deltas, allowing the attacker to hide timeouts and withhold the payment for a long period. The next figure explores how the attack would work on the Lightning Network at different times. We use snapshots staking over several months. The results generally show that the attack gets easier as time passes, with a slight improvement from May 2020. This can be explained by the changes made to default parameters, increasing lock time max, and decreasing CLTV expiry delta, both making it easier to construct long routes with high timeouts. We move to the second attack, where we aim to disconnect as many pairs of nodes as possible and break the network into separate components. Like in the first attack, the attacker chooses routes that contain channels that he wants to remove from the network and sends through them many unresolved payments, exhausting the number of simultaneously open HTLCs. We explore several algorithms to select the attacked routes. The first one uses the same greedy algorithm we saw previously, only changing the weight to the unweighted between centrality measurement of edges taking inspiration from the Gearan-Newman algorithm. The second approach utilizes spectral clustering to repeatedly cut the large connected component. The last approach uses a simplified version of kearney hanlin algorithm that starts with an arbitrary partition that separates one fourth of the nodes and greedily swaps nodes across the cut to minimize the cut. This yielded the best results. Looking at the graph, we see that while before the attack, almost all pairs of nodes are connected, using only 32 attacker channels, we disconnect 23% of the pairs in the network, and with 385 channels, we disconnect half of the pairs. In the third attack, we want to disconnect a single node from the rest of the network. The adversary connects to the victim node and paralyzes its adjacent channels by making multiple payment requests over a path, going back and forth through the victim's channels. Note that the attack is still possible to carry out if the victim does not accept direct connections. In this case, we would connect to neighbors of the victim. We simulated an attack over some prominent nodes in the network, evaluating how much it would cost to attack them. We see that async, which holds 774 channels, and a total capacity which equals to 10.8% of the entire network, requires the attacker to open 151 channels in order to paralyze it. The last entry in the table relates to an attack on LNDIG, a single entity that controls 25 nodes, which are extremely central to the network. We took a snapshot of the network and ran simulation of the attack on each node individually. The results show the relation between the degree and the number of channels attackers needed to perform the attack on each node. We can see that most nodes have a very low degree 
and are extremely easy to isolate. We also estimated the cost of isolating nodes running one of the major implementations, assuming default values are used by it and its neighbors. We calculated the number of channels the attacker needs to open in order to isolate a node for three days for different degrees. The implementations differ due to their different default values, and as we can see, nodes which run LND implementation would be the easiest to attack. Before moving on to suggestions on how to mitigate the attack, we explained that the vulnerability is hard to fix since it arises from fundamental properties of the network. First, payments are executed using conditional payment contracts in order to be trustless. Second, expiration times are long to allow nodes sufficient time to appeal in closer scenarios and prevent dishonest parties from stealing the funds. And last, privacy. The network utilizes online routing that does not allow intermediate nodes on the path to recognize where payments originate and where they are going, allowing the attack to act with impunity. These three make it very difficult to prevent the attack. We discussed several mitigation techniques that make the attacker harder to carry out. The first one is enforcing fast HTLC resolution. It's a way to enforce blame on misbehaving nodes. The idea is that each node should announce to the next node on the route its own deadline for resolving the HTLC. This deadline is different and much shorter than the HTLC expiration. It will allow it to communicate an earlier deadline for HTLC resolution to its next hop. If the timeout arrives and the HTLC was not fulfilled or canceled, the node will wait for the HTLC to naturally expire, but will close the channel with its neighbor. To avoid having all channels along the path closed due to a failure to complete the HTLC in time, and specifically to avoid closing channels between compliant nodes, the last node in the path will provide proof of the channel closure to its predecessors. This can be done using a zero knowledge proof, for example. The next suggestion is to lower the maximum allowed route length, which is currently 20 hops. The Lightning network is highly connected and the smaller number of hosts would still suffice. In the figure, we show the fraction of successfully attacked capacity, assuming that different maximum route lengths are allowed. We see that attackers need many more channels to attack if they are forced to use shorter route lengths. We show two additional suggestions. Currently, most nodes use the default value configured by the implementations they run for the maximum transfers they are willing to hold concurrently. In all cases, this value may not exceed the number 483, which is derived from the blockchain's limitations. We suggest changing the way nodes configure this parameter, adjusting the value according to the level of trust they have in particular peers. Setting a high value for some peer effectively allows it to route many concurrent payments through our node and to do more damage if it is malicious. Therefore, newly created channels with unknown and untrusted nodes should default to a low max concurrent HTLCs. The second suggestion is to stop allowing back and forth payment routes on channels. This will make our specific technique to isolate individual nodes harder to carry out, but does not solve the issue entirely. To summarize, we discussed how to leverage a limitation on the number of HTLCs in payment channels to attack the network. We discussed network-wide attacks and also more localized node isolation attacks. Our paper includes statistics I do not have time to show on several aspects of the Lightning Network that are relevant to the attack and that may be of independent interest. We discussed the cost of each attack relative to the level of harm an attacker can cause. In the paper, you'll also be able to read about additional small proof of concept experience we did to demonstrate the attack using actual lightning nodes on a local test network. We discussed several short-term mitigation approaches that make the attack more difficult to carry out and reduce its efficiency. I want to thank my co-author Aviv Zohar for this work, but we also received many useful improvements for this paper by Swiss students from the Hebrew University. Itai Cohen, Nir Lavi, and Svi Ishai. That's all. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. 
feel free to contact us if you have any comments or questions.